Good afternoon. I hope your day has been great so far. And welcome to the Double Helix stage sponsored by Gemscript. My name is Kathy Young, and I am the head of US sales and tech support team of Gemscript Life Science Group. It's my great pleasure to be here, and I'll be the moderator for this session. So a little bit background about our company. Gemscript is a global biotech company specializes in providing life science research related services and products. We proudly serve more than 200,000 clients in over 100 regions and countries worldwide. And since our inception in 2002, we have been pioneers in the gene synthesis industry and also have been one of the leader, leading providers in uh, synthetic biology tools and solutions and services for the past 20 years. So um, today we um, have, uh, it's our great honor to have invited four distinguished speakers, Dr. Bill Liu from Santa Clara University, Dr. Mark Blanner from University of De uh, Delaware, and we will also have Dr. Pusu Huang from Stanford University, and Dr. D. Park uh, Ragathman from Allozyme. So they will be sharing uh, with us their experiments, their, their insights with us, and showcasing the power of synthetic biology um, in terms of driving different applications. In terms of, um, for example, nanomedicine engineering, my microbial metabolic pathway engineering, and also um, immune modulation, as well as industrial enzyme evolution. So, um, we will have uh, our first two speakers um, uh, talk about their uh, researches and sciences, and then we will have a short break, and then we will proceed to the next two speakers. So uh, before we proceed to our first speaker, I'd like to invite the president of Genscript Life Science Group, Dr. Ray Chen, to give us a five minutes opening to the stage. Thank you everyone for coming today. They give me a very strict line, five minutes, so I have already used uh, 10 seconds. But I really want to uh, thank you all for coming to this stage and for the double helix. Uh, but I, I'm not sure how much you know about Janscript, although Cassie gave some fancy words. I just wanted to share with you some stories and some guiding principles that we have been following. We get started with $5,000 in New Jersey about 20 years ago. And with a very simple idea to make genes in a better and easy way for researchers. That's how we get started. Like all the powerful ideas that this becomes our mission and becomes what we're trying to achieve be an enabling a platform through offering a lot of a comprehensive uh, portfolios in terms of services and tours. And a lot of you might not know that 20 years ago, synthesized gene is $5 per PP. And right now, several cents. And we are behind, and actually we are the engineer to drive that trend. Ever since the year 2008, we're the number one in terms of the market share and in terms of genes synthesized. And also, we talked about yesterday that uh, one of the stage that we introduced about uh, this stuff, right? The cheap uh, article synthesis that we uh, acquired and worked with the customer array. We're talking about this from the 10K density to 92 density to 8 million. And we try to find out the solutions to apply to gene fragment. Right now we are launching in a very cost effective way and I can accept most of the sequences. That's a little bit things I wanted to share with you that we're really behind a lot of movement in the synthetic biology field and beyond that as well. The thing is that every time I come here in this stage, in this conference, I heard uh, the best, the largest, the number one, the highest quality, the quickest turnaround from all of the vendors. We have this box and we can turn this, get in and output is magic. That's what my perception is. And maybe this is a perception for a lot of companies in this field as well. That's fascinating, right? But 
we are making small steps each day. That's what we're dedicated to do. That's what we're committed to do, to do. And that's our passion to do. Because this field is fascinating in a way that is infinite. We're not talking about anything in, within our company about where we will become number one. We are, but yeah, but we, we, we want to be the best and what specs or things like that. We just want to be small, tiny, a little bit better versus before. And that's what we're dedicated to do. And we're committed to do. And we're more committed than ever to provide our services and uh, offerings globally. And wanted to share with you that we opened the site in Singapore, and we, we, we expand in Seattle. We're expanding greatly in Piscataway, New Jersey, and uh, globally that we are truly thankful that uh, we are in this journey together with our customers, with all, all of you, for this fascinating research. No matter is finding the, the, the loop, the perfect loop for, 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 for the tumor cells, no matter is microbe engineering, or no matter is enzyme engineering with cell free, or with, no matter it is anything that we're talking about, this is infinite journey. And we're just thankful uh, to, uh, to be there together with all of you. All right, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's hear about the researchers. Thank you. Okay, can I have my slides? Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation from GenScript. You know, part of my research is, uh, is carried out in the company because they provide me. Can I have my slides? So today I'm going to talk about synthetic biology and its application for nanomedicine. And here, uh, maybe some people don't have ideas. Okay. Should I go forward or no? Okay, <laughs> where I am. So, Nanomedicine is a new kind of, new class of medicine, and, uh, and you may hear it the first time, but it's already arrived about 20 years, and it become mainstream medicine today. And previously, everybody knows we have medicine, we'll talk about small molecule medicine, but today, almost half of the medicine come into the market, we, we call nanomedicine. We talk about antibody. We talk about the gene therapy. We call, talk about the CAR T therapy. We talk about uh, RNA vaccination. They are all nanomedicine. So, uh, is, is, is that's okay. Uh, so my work is, is try to use a new material we call a, at nanoscale and to uh, invent some new kind of medicine we call nanomedicine, which is differ from already I talk about a pure protein medicine, pure of gene medicine, uh, and other medicine, of course, is different from the small molecule medicine. And also the other medicine we already know is that the cell, which is a micro medicine, and we call the tissue medicine, which is even bigger. And we also talk about organs, even bigger one. As you can see, the spectrum from very small and very big, oh, good. From very small and very big, 
we all filled it up previously about 20 years ago. From 20 years forward, you can see the antibody uh, MRI vaccination, CARDI gene therapy, and all fill in. And this is an unexplored area we call the nanomedicine world. And my work is concentrating a new material we call the exosome. Exosome is a special class, a new class of materials is sized at 30 to 200 nanometers, which is perfect for medicine. So I'm talking about it. Try to convince you here. Can I move my slide forward? Next slide. Sorry, I can't, cannot control it. Okay. So for, uh, for nanomedicine, uh, previously, like uh, 50 years, we use the inorganic in materials, and we migrated too quickly to organic materials. Oh, no, it's working. Uh, And we come to the lipsome and we come to exosome is evolution from uh, uh, not biocompatible uh, to biocompatible and the engineerability from low to high from a medical imaging diagnosis migrate to treatment. So as you can see, this is the winner and the first time we are so successfully used for medicine for uh, RNA vaccine, we use lipsome. And here, uh, expecting we have a lot of medicine based on exosome, which is the new kind of materials, is 100% come from our own body. And uh, we build up medicine on this uh, 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 cell-derived um, nanoparticles, and is already emerging, in, you know, as an important medicine. About 100 to 200 of uh, exosome-based medicine are in clinical trial, as you can see. Okay. So uh, why is exosome uh, is better than previously? I mentioned that it, it, it's, I repeat it because it's unique size. And it's very stable. It's much stable than the liposome, and it's a 100% biocompatible and biodegradable, and it has intrinsic ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and even get inside of the cell, which is cannot match by the liposome, which is artificial lipids. So, and also, uh, uh, it can be modified or engineered uh, further for medicine. So right now, actually, exosome, you, if you are in this field, you already know they can be used to produce nanovaccine, and which is as much more powerful for cancer therapy, P for neurological diseases, for genetic disorders, for tissue damage and aging everywhere. And about, I mentioned about more than 100 clinical trials uh, to test applications. But this wonderful nanoscale uh, material is not bone for therapy. It's not, it does not carry intrinsic drug. Uh, and it also have some tissue specificity we can exploit, but by the spe uh, specificity is not so high. So we are trying to solve two problems. How can we use uh, synthetic uh, biology to modify or engineer exosome to achieve two goals? One is to load the therapeutic drug to this uh, nanoscale exosome, and also how do we program them like a Uber to go somewhere as we wish. So for targeted uh, therapy for precision medicine.
So what do we do? Actually, we want to use gene as a program so we can introduce the gene to the cell. And these genes are so smart, they can navigate through the cellular system, and they will go into what we call the exosomes and orient it on the surface of exosome, and sometimes we can see, go with them, we can load our drug. We can load the image molecule like a GFP, and we also can uh, modify or functionize the outer surface for specific tissue targeting for uh, precision medicine. So basically, we can use a kind of what we call a magic uh, molecule, and this magic molecule will go to the exosome uh, in our cells. Uh, and we can use this magical molecule we call the scaffolds to, uh, to uh, attach the drugs, uh, to attach the imaging molecule, uh, to attach a targeting molecule, uh, and introduce to the cell. So the cell has the program. When they do the program, they will produce, you know, exosome which has those modifications. So uh, we studied the cellular pathway, we find, you know, uh, uh, like the molecule-like M structure on the cellular uh, membrane, it transmembrane four times, we call it a tetraspan, and, and it has a specific ability to participate into the exosomes. So, so CD63, CD9, CD81 are some of these endogenous proteins. They say, what we can do about this? What we can do actually to attach a medicine, you know, uh, uh, inside of this lumen. So this Uber can carry on medicine and protect it and go inside of the tissue targeted and even can deliver not to the door side but also inside of the cell. I told you it has a tissue penetrating ability, can go to the brain, can also break the membrane and even go inside of the cell. We can present some of the you know, molecule on the surface if the therapeutic need a surface uh, exposure to the diseased molecule. As you can see, when we do this engineering, we synthesize this gene, and we introduce this gene to a living human cell culture in the dishes, they are successfully go to the exosome compartment. And those dots are inside of the cells, uh, and they are biogenic pathways and produce the exosomes. And, and uh, and we prove that those are uh, successful uh, uh, scaffolds. Actually, if you attach a you know, light uh, molecule like GFP, RFP to these scaffolds, it goes inside exactly the machine and produce exosome, and the exosome actually can secrete it after secretion our normal exome do not have a GFP, and now you can have GFP, you can see them, they are like a fish swim in the media. Uh, uh, and now we discover about, the, you know, uh, three of them are, are, can be used to, uh, to do this job. Okay. So we are kind of have a tool, it allow, you know, enable us to do some modifications specifically inside of a living human cells. So we can use human cell as a, a bioreactor and produce a, a kind of a, a exosome which previously is native, has a very low therapeutic power. Now we can put a medicine uh, you know, on the surface or inside of this uh, nano, uh, 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 Vesicles, as you can see, the you know the native one has the CD63 tetraspan, and it does not have the medicine. So, so we can kind of put a, you know something on the end or on the 
after surface because the M structure, there's two loop upside. We can put, you know, upside, we can put them inside. If the GIP can, you know, can be a drug, can be an imager, and, and the upside can be a drug, can be a targeting molecule. And here we want to show, and you know, this exosome we can program as a biological sponge. So the idea is that the nano um, uh, uh, vesicles has a large surface area. It can have hundreds of thousand molecules on the surface. If uh, on the surface, uh, if we install a, a binding molecule, can specifically binding the toxins. That we will function by the biological sponge for a variety of diseases. Here we want to show if we replace this um, image molecule with a therapeutic molecule, which can bind a very bad molecule we call the tumor necrosis factor, which causes inflammation. It involves many diseases, and uh, you know you can see this is the, a, a list uh, of. Uh, 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 of a disease can be treated by previous by uh, anybody, but now we can use uh, uh, you know uh, exosome as a new treatment. So basically, what we do uh, is put a, uh, you know use the CD sixty three as a scaffold and bring this kind of therapeutic molecule on the surface. And here is just to to show you that uh, we use this uh, uh, molecule to introduce them into uh, the human cells. We culture them, we transform them. They can permanently produce medicine for us. So when the medicine is produced, uh, you, know, we are, you know, we are here trying to test the efficacy of our new medicine and immediately you know, carry it uh, you know, around by the exosome. As you can see, this is a called culture experiment. Basically, some of the cells can produce exosomes, and some of the cells can, as a readout, to import, uh, to report, you know, uh, either they are affected by the toxin we call the TNF and cause inflammation or not. As you can see with the co-culture, and this exosome can attenuate inflammation from 100 to almost half of the level. So that proof in principle, it can work, okay? When we harvest the exosome, which it can have a specific ability to bind this kind of toxin, we call the uh, tumor necrosis factor, as you can see with the dose, if you increase the a higher dose, it can almost can complete the block. Uh, the TNF causes inflammation. So, so, so this is uh, uh, this work was published, you know, uh, several years ago, and uh, it become our patent technology. I'm not sure if I stop here or if I still have some time. Okay, I just go uh, through this. So, so we are kind of trying to do something, engineer a nanomedicine, which is produced by uh, living human cells. We use synthetic biology and DNA to program the cell to achieve that. And uh, the previously we show we can use the endogenous protein we call the CD63, CD9, CD81. Can we use the other? even smarter, even more robust uh, of scaffold to do the same things. And these scaffolds here we are identified, we call it a VSVG, it's a virus molecule, it's a very powerful molecule. It's very simple than the CD system because it has transmembrane once. Okay, so this configuration is very desirable because you can simply put a, a, a drug inside of the uh, 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 lumen or put a targeting molecule on the opposite side. Uh, and the VSVG also have a, a molecule already have a high affinity to the cell and uh, will allow the cell to take it up 
to be internalized 100%. So VSVG is a very, very powerful molecule, as, as, as you can see, and we try to see if the VSVG can magically only go to the exosome but not other places. And this work, when we attach them to the uh, fluorescent proteins, it go to the right compartment and actually co-localized with exosome uh, markers, uh, CD63, and also RAB5A, uh, which is the endocytic compartment, which is the biogenic site of exosomes. So basically, if we modify exome by the VSVG, as you can see, is very powerful. The cellular uptake from minimum to a very robust level at different, uh, for different cell types. Here we have uh, happy G to the liver cells. This is the brain cells. Uh, this is the kidney cells. And this is a fibroblast cells. This is a, a stem cell, which is very, very difficult to deliver anything inside of the stem cell. It is a challenge, but the, this modified exosome can do this. And, and you can see when we have quantification, and the, through this modification, it increased about tenfold uh, of levels. So it's a very uh, dramatic uh, uh, changes. Now we use that uh, for uh, for treating uh, uh, the biggest class of uh, uh, genetic disease we call the lysosomal storage disease, which uh, comprise over 50 uh, of uh, different type of, uh, uh, of uh, human diseases. Basically, there are a defect of the lysosome enzymes. A lysosome enzyme can be like 70 of enzymes. Any enzyme have defect, you will have a deadly disease. So can we use this VSVG uh, as a powerful molecule to deliver the drug not only to the cells, but also to the lysosomal uh, or intracellular organelles? Uh, and to cut the long story short, when we attach our uh, you know, uh, enzyme to VSVG scaffolds, actually they can not only uptake by the cells, but also to the right compartment to replace the defect uh, enzymes. So it provides a normal ways and a very powerful ways to treat a very difficult uh, uh, diseases. Uh, so this is to show our work this, that we can use this system to produce a nanomedicine, which is the right size and carries, uh, you know, most likely these nanoparticles are exosome because they carry a variety of, of the markers indicating they are nanoparticles, the size are exosomes. And uh, all those exosomes, not only, you know, this is the, the white, a white type exosome that do not carry any therapeutic drugs. Our engineered exosome also carry our drugs. Uh, and you can see uh, when we load this enzyme, when we load this therapeutic enzyme to the exosome, they actually, the enzyme is also have the activities and they can do the job when we fit onto the cells. So this is to show you uh, visually that uh, you know uh, the cell can internalize our medicine and, and the internalization to the right compartment, which is the endosome, and uh, merged with the exosomes, uh, with the lysosomes, which can be used for uh, precision medicine for the treatment of the largest uh, 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 family of uh, uh, lysosomal diseases. So I stop here. Uh, if you have any questions, I think my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for the presentation. I was wondering what is your mechanism actually for being inhibited by using exosomes? Is it an agonist? 
<laughs> you are using the right words. It's an antagonist mechanism. It is the receptor binding to the TNF. The TNF is, in, is the major, the number one inflammation caused uh, uh, aging in our body. If we bind into it, it's preventing it's interact with other uh, uh, healthy cells. So that's the mechanism. That's very, very documented. I, I, I believe some of you here, here are, are using a kind of uh, antibody therapy or, uh, you know, it's towards binding to the TNF alpha. It's very, very documented, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. The paper said is uh, sometimes it's not uh, have a, uh, it's magically it's bigger or exosome, but it has much better pe tissue penetrating ability than anybody that is small peptide than anything else. We don't quite understand it. Uh, like you have inflammation and some of your medicine may not have reached to the place, but exosome has the intrinsic ability to do that. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, you already mentioned them all. So basically, we isolate the exosome already secreted outside of the cell. So we need to harvest the media. And then you use ultra-centrifuge, centrifuge, or you will use antibody to purify them. There's a variety of, uh, uh, of protocols we can follow. So basically, you isolate it from, uh, from the cultural media. It's quite a simple uh, to do, but, but to be pure is kind of very complicated, yeah, uh, procedures. Uh, I call it nanoscale. It's small enough to penetrate tissues, but it's bigger enough to carry thousands of small molecules, even antibody, on your surface. So the size really matters for nanomedicine. If it's too big, the cell cannot handle it. If it's too small, it's everywhere. So we are, we are going to be, you know, like a nano size, carry many, many small molecules, anybody, and, and go, and they can cross cells, cross endocellular cells without a problem. We don't know, quite understand why it is, you know, part of our research on that part. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, I happen to have a PhD uh, uh, degree on lipids, so so make my life easy to study these lipid-based uh, nanoparticles. So nobody has a good idea uh, how many particles that the cell can produce from our own experience. One human cell can produce 100 to 1,000 exosomes per day. So you can isolate it, you know, uh, fairly easily according to this number. So we have variations of different, that's, that's the number we accumulate about 10 years study. So, so that's come to the number, uh, how much we can produce. So, so we can increase them by different modulations, but the ball range is, is 100 to 1,000. The cell have intrinsic ability to produce them. So now we, you are blood, we have more exosomes than our cells. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah. enlightening talk and your questions for 
Next, let's welcome our second speaker, Dr. Mark Blenner from University of Delaware to show us how to build a microbial circular ecology by synthetic biology. All right. Oh. All right, well, um, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. This is my first in BioBeta. Uh, it's very inspiring to see everything this community has done. And I'm excited to share with you today um, what um, my lab has been working on. So I'm Mark Blenner. I'm an associate professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at the University of Delaware. Um, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work we're doing towards discovery, domestication, and engineering of, div uh, of diverse microbes for a sustainable future. Um, and so uh, you're, I'm going to tell two stories. Um, uh, the first is kind of the longer arc in my lab, uh, where we've, um, for, since, since my lab started in 2012, we've been um, uh, studying, engineering, developing new synthetic biology tools for an oleaginous yeast known as Euroia lipolytica. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, our, our really recent work um, that's very exciting in the area of plastics biodegradation. Um, and uh, sprinkled throughout these talks, I'm going to highlight different places where um, uh, synthetic biology, especially the, the, the synthetic biology that's been, been provided to us by Genscript, um, has really enabled us to, to go farther and faster. So um, in, in my lab, uh, we, when I started, we, we sort of took a look at the landscape and said, you know, we see lots of people doing work with model organisms, with E. coli and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and, and one of the things that became apparent to, to me was, okay, these systems are great. They have wonderful tools. We know lots about them. But what we don't, um, what, what's more challenging is if you want to start using um, complex phenotypes, so, so things like tolerance to different conditions and um, um, the ability to use uh, more recalcitrant substrates, that these are really difficult properties to engineer. Um, and so uh, we, we also took a look at the landscape and said, well, there's lots and lots of um, non-model and non-conventional microorganisms that are out there that have a lot of these complex phenotypes. What they don't have are those genetic engineering tools. <clears throat> and so, um, uh, so basically, uh, if we spend more time developing tools um, and start with, with organisms with more of these complex phenotypes that we're interested in, we've got to do less work, right? So this just seems like a, a smart way to, um, uh, to, to launch one's career. And there we go. Not sure why I'm not advancing at this point, but um, uh, battery's working. Anyway, I'll try and talk through this, but we'll have to move the slide forward at some point. So um, the uh, uh, um, oh, went too far. Yeah. There we go. Am I back in control yet or no? No. All right, so, um, uh, so, so we chose to work with um, sort of the non-model and non-conventional organisms. Uh, and uh, we, you know, in, in, in starting any project, we sort of go through a, a, um, a thought process about you know, what, what is it we're trying to accomplish and looking and see what, what's out there that has sort of those, those more difficult properties. Um, and so, so we sort of devalue in our assessment things like does it have genetic tools, because we think we can build a lot of those. Um, and, and so uh, when we started off, uh, we were doing things like choosing our organisms based on a survey of the literature, or going into, um, uh, into to culture collections that are publicly available, and um, you know, we've, we've brought you know, hundreds of these strains into, in, into our own lab, uh, and we will screen some of those for, for interesting phenotypes that were relevant to particular projects. Uh, more recently, we've started looking uh, directly in the environment in some interesting places like mealworms and concrete to try and identify um, uh, other microorganisms that have uh, even more complex phenotypes that we're, we'll find even more difficult uh, to engineer. The next slide, please. So um, the, the, the longest lasting uh, work in my lab is with Euroia lipolitica. Euroia lipolitica is um, it's kind of the, no, the model non-model organism. Uh, it's, um, it's an oleaginous yeast, and so it's, it's got the ability to accumulate large amounts of lipids. And we found this interesting um, from the perspective of our, my, my, my original interest in uh, developing ways to make uh, sustainable fuels, as well as replacing a lot of petroleum-based chemicals, in which carbon-carbon bond formation is the key, uh, key chemistry there. Um, and, and so uh, using an organism that's really good at fatty acid biosynthesis makes a lot of sense, as that's sort of nature's most efficient carbon-carbon um, bond-forming chemistry. 
The Royal Lip Politica also has a number of other really favorable properties listed up here. Um, I won't go through all of them, but um, uh, things like tolerance to various types of salts and chemicals are, of course, incredibly important um, for, for using uh, lower value, more sustainable, more calcitrant substrates. Um, and uh, there was already some uh, established genetic engineering tools. So this gave us a way to sort of get our foot in the door. And we spent a lot of time in the first few years of my lab developing additional tool sets um, to, to help us engineer your Roy Lipolitica faster and, and more accurately. Um, one of the things we discovered very early on was that when we were uh, codon optimizing genes for heterologous expression in this organism, um, we, we found that uh, we had very unreliable results. Um, in terms of our, our ability to express uh, functionally active protein uh, at high levels. Um, and so we tried a couple of different um, um, companies, uh, gene synthesis optimization algorithms, and we found that the GenScript codon optimization tool seemed to produce the most reliable and best results. And so my lab, for any of our projects involving Euroia Politica, we've relied heavily on, um, on, on GenScript's um, uh, algorithm for, uh, for gene synthesis. Next, oh, there we go. Okay, um, and so let me tell you a little bit about the work we've done. Um, everything I'm, I'm gonna present today is, is unpublished work that um, is kind of uh, re recently done by my lab, and so uh, I like to, to highlight the unpublished stuff because you can always read about our published work. Um, so uh, this work was done by a, a senior graduate student, Vijay Ganesan, who is looking for a job. Uh, he'll be available at the end of the year. Come speak to me afterwards if you're interested. Uh, he, he decided that he was interested in developing a, a, a tool that would allow us to do um, more rapid uh, pathway optimization. So as we're building longer and longer pathways in this yeast, um, it's, it's, it's obvious to us that um, you know, the, the, the optimal solution for multi-gene pathways, especially with branching points uh, and that connect into central metabolism, is not necessarily to turn every gene up to 11. Um, it's, we, wanna, we wanna fine tune the expression levels and balance the expression along the pathway. Um, and, and so uh, what he did was he picked up on some work that my lab had started previously looking at different elements in the promoter regions. Uh, and, and so he honed in on the, the TATA box, the TATA box. So this is just eight base pairs um, in the core promoter region. Uh, and um, uh, what we found previously was that this actually, th this element acts in a fairly modular fashion, more modular than any other elements we've looked at in promoters. Um, and so we're able to uh, 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 change that eight base pair sequence, and by doing so, we can tune the level of expression that we get out of these promoters, while otherwise maintaining all the other characteristics of things like inducibility um, that, that are inherent to the promoter structure. Um, and so uh, he went ahead and made a library here where he just randomized eight positions, used it to drive the expression of GFP, and then did, uh, did fact sorting to identify um, uh, sequences which mapped to either high, medium, or low expression levels. Um, we then took uh, our sequencing data, we isolated uh, individual sequences that gave us sort of a, a, a wide range of expression levels from strong to weak, um, and then placed those eight, eight base pairs in the promoter regions, driving the expression of four different genes to make um, a compound called deoxyviolosin. Um, we, it's not a terribly interesting compound, it's just purple and easy to screen, but um, the, the, uh, the point here was uh, we were able to then take these four genes, have five levels, um, for each gene and do every combination to make a 625 pathway library. Uh, and uh, what Vijay did was then he screened all that, uh, identified the, uh, some of the better producing clones, um, and, and what we've seen is, is interesting. Um, I won't go too much into the details here, but um, the, the, we, we get non-obvious combinations back, right? We don't get the solution that every gene should be expressed as, to its max level. Um, and, and we can see sort of the relative importance of different genes in balancing this pathway. So, um, uh, that, that tool is um, being put to use in other projects in our lab um, and will be um, something we continue on in the future. Uh, another project going on in my lab uh, related to Euroia Politica um, is done by uh, one of my senior postdocs, uh, Dr. Sivachandran, also looking for a job right now. Um, and he's worked on uh, the production of fatty alcohols in Euroia Politica. Um, we know that fatty alcohols at high titers can be uh, toxic to cells, and so we decided to uh, try and compartmentalize this reaction in the peroxisome of the yeast, uh, and um, uh, doing so seemed to be important for getting any kind of measurable titers out of these systems. Um, uh, we tried different ways of localizing these enzyme, uh, this particular enzyme, the fatty acyl-CoA reductase, which is necessary for uh, making fatty alcohols. 
um, uh, we, we used different ways of, of, of targeting it to the peroxisome, and uh, that resulted in different efficiencies in, in our uh, fatty alcohol production. Um, he also came up with this clever idea of saying, well, if we want the, we want the, uh, the FAR enzyme to end up in the peroxisome, um, why don't we fuse it to a native uh, enzyme, which goes to the peroxisome, which is the three cat enzyme, um, which is producing the substrate, the fatty acyl CoA, for the FAR enzyme. And so by making this fusion protein, now we are co-localizing um, the substrate producing enzyme and the, the alcohol producing enzyme together. Um, and doing so ended up doubling our titer. So um, we were really excited to see that the strategy uh, was as successful as it was. Um, and then uh, went ahead and tried to solve another problem, um, which was that uh, the FAR enzyme requires NADPH as a cofactor um, to reduce uh, the acyl-CoA into the alcohol, and um, th these are not natively uh, in, at high levels in, uh, in peroxisomes. Um, in fact, the peroxisome is very rich in, NAD in NADH um, as a result of going through the beta, you know, fatty acids being um, truncated through the beta oxidation cycle. So uh, the, what we ended up doing here was taking um, uh, trying to increase the NADPH concentrations in the, in the peroxisome, uh, two different ways that worked both very well. One was taking this POS5, which is an NADH kinase, um, localizing it to the peroxisome, and then that basically, using ATP though, converts NADP, NADH to NADPH. Uh, we saw basically a doubling in the titers if we did that. Um, similar increase in titer was seen if we used other enzymes like IDP3, which um, also would facilitate increasing the availability of NADPH in the peroxisome. We also showed that under these conditions, it's actually that, that the NADA, NADPH availability is likely the rate limiting step at this point, uh, and it's not the, the catalytic efficiency um, of the FAR because you know, multiple copies here didn't change really our titers. Um, I'll, that was a result showing we did this in bioreactor. We have some of the highest titers um, reported in, in, uh, for fatty alcohols in, uh, in, in eukaryotic systems in yeast. Um, uh, let me get on to this next thing since I know we're behind on time. The, uh, the, the last thing I want to bring up in our Euroila politica storyline is um, the thing that makes Euroila politica good at producing um, fatty, fatty acids uh, is its native, its intrinsic high flux for acetyl CoA um, and the availability of NADPH uh, to drive um, um, uh, the reaction of acetyl CoA to form fatty acids. These kinds of pathways are also intrinsically important for, um, for, for high flux to things like monoterpenoids. Um, and more complex molecules like monoterpene indoalkaloids that we're interested in making. Um, and so uh, one of my uh, sort of mid-career PhD students who's not yet looking for a job, but will be in a couple of years, um, is working on uh, building our monoterpene pathways. Um, and so she's basically taken, in, in her first study, she's taken strategies that were known in the literature already that have been demonstrated in Saccharomyces, just implemented them in Euroila bolitica, which we think is an intrinsically better system to make these kinds of compounds. Um, and with doing nothing else really that special, we've achieved the highest titers reported for geraniol in a eukaryotic system. Um, and, and so uh, we're continuing on building this pathway out now towards, um, towards making uh, mono, monoterpene indoalkaloids. Um, and, and a lot of this is enabled by um, um, some work we're uh, continuing to do using some, GenScript, uh, some of the new GenScript products, the GenTitan um, gene fragments. Okay, so let me switch into the, the second part of my story, which is uh, exciting stuff that we're um, re excited, we're just excited to share with the world right now. Not published yet. Um, I'll, I'll skip the, the preamble to this just to move on with our story, but we're really interested in um, figuring out what nature can do for degrading plastics. Now, there's lots of great work in plastic degradation, plastic biodegradation that has come out in the last about decade or so, focused mostly on PET. PET is hydrolyzable, uh, is a hydrolyzable plastic. Um, uh, so, so no disrespect to any of that great work that's going on in that space. Um, we, we just felt like, one, it was crowded. Two, we already know how to recycle PET well. It's human behavior that's really the problem. And so we decided that if we were going to go into the plastic biodegradation space, that we were going to tackle um, uh, more difficult plastics. So we're focusing on polyolefins like polyethylene and polypropylene, as well as polystyrene, so the non-hydrolyzable plastics. Um, it's harder to imagine how microbes might actually degrade these things efficiently. Um, the, the majority of the people that are trying to enter the space now are doing things that are reminiscent to what we've seen with uh, biomass degradation. They'll, they'll go and bioprospect areas that are rich in the compounds that you'd like to see degradation of, right? So um, lots of people have looked at like landfills and recycling uh, areas as well as plastic-rich marine environments. 
the problem with looking at these places is that degradation is actually very slow. It happens, but it's over the, the course of decades and, and centuries. So um, we, we asked the question of whether or not there is somewhere in nature where plastic was actually being degraded. These kinds of plastics are being degraded at higher rates. Turns out um, that insect larvae, like the yellow mealworm, are actually very good at degrading, um, at degrading a wide variety of plastics. Oops. Good. Oh, went too far. OK. So, um, uh, we're fortunate to get funding from the Department of Energy to like dive into this topic of trying to basically understand like how does the yellow mealworm and its gut microbiome, which we believe is the main act, the main sort of source of action here. Um, so how, how do how does the organism and its gut microbiome uh, facilitate plastics biodegradation? Um, and then what can we learn by uh, diving into the genomes of the organisms involved? Um, looking at the interactions amongst the community of microorganisms, and then um, eventually uh, the goal will be to develop genetic tools for these new, um, newly discovered organisms so that we can uh, engineer them and use the power of synthetic biology to really make this uh, an, an efficient process. So um, we, we've started, uh, we went and uh, looked at what the mealworms are doing. Um, uh, again, I know I'm short on time, so I will probably cut through some of this. Um, we, we fed the mealworms a diet of plastic, and just like you can't survive on sugar alone, these things really don't do well if you just give them plastic. So we had to give them some other nutrients, so we used some low-value waste-type um, supplements that I'm not naming here, but uh, we found that certain supplements, like supplement B, um, were really, ex really accelerated the rate at which the mealworms were able to eat the plastics, and so you can kind of see the difference here between uh, this is polystyrene. Um, you can see the mealworms. You can't really see this picture well, but they've degraded this plastic a good bit after seven days. When we give them the supplement, it's all gone. Um, it's, it's a pretty dramatic result. Uh, supplement B seemed to be the only thing that was impacting the rate at which these things were degrading plastics um, by a, a statistical test that we did. Um, and, and we can see that the acceleration occurred with both polystyrene and low-density polyethylene. There we go. Um, we have uh, a verification that, uh, that these mealworms are actually causing the degradation, the chemical modification, the oxidation of, um, of plastics like LDPE. Um, so we can see different appearances of, of, um, of, of oxygen groups in the FTIR data. Um, and this is probably the most striking data we have is um, this is GPC. So we're seeing the molecular weight of the, the LDPE. And the black thing here is. Um, the original LDP that was uh, previous to being fed to the mealworm. Um, and then you can see the appearance of this massively large, um, much lower molecular weight. There's a log scale down here, peak. So we can see a lot of degradation of the plastic in sort of what's left over um, from the mealworm uh, digestive tract. Oops, way too many slides. All right, back, back. Um, so we just. Yeah. So we decided to um, look at the gut microbiome in isolation. So we took it, we dissected the worms, we isolated the microbiomes, uh, the microbial communities in the guts. We were able to culture them planktonically um, and uh, give them um, a diet which was almost exclusively, the, the, most of the carbon came from uh, LDP. Uh, and we can see a significant amount of growth um, even in the course of just a day or two. Um, using LDPE as, uh, these are now microplastics as a substrate. You were seeing macroplastics in the previous slides. Um, we could take out the gut microbiomes and place them on, um, on an LDPE film, and we can even see there that we're getting that low molecular weight peak showing up, um, uh, resulting from the action of the microbial community in the absence of the worm. Um, we were able to isolate, we went through sort of standard micro, uh, microbiology methodological isolations of different microbes that came from that community. Um, we didn't do any further enrichment, but uh, we, we were able to test 150 isolates. We found five that seemed to be most proficient. We se we've sequenced four of them so far, so we know what these are. Um, but they, they're effective at degrading LDPE and ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene that's been hydroxylated and some other plastics that we're not showing here. Um, and then we used XPS to confirm that we're actually seeing some chemical modifications with some of these isolates. Um, and, and again, we're seeing uh, this oxidative chemistry show up here. So the last thing I want to point out is, um, and, and then I'll, I'll stop and let you get your five minutes of coffee, um, is that we, we've started to examine um, the genome of one, uh, in depth of isolate three. Uh, and uh, in that genome, we've seen an enrichment of enzymes that we would predict rationally might be associated with plastic degradation. Um, and um, um, we, we picked 10 just kind of ad, ad hoc. 
uh, and expressed them in E. coli uh, and without purifying the enzymes even um, treated plastics. Uh, we, we found one enzyme, which was a peroxidase, that um, um, uh, we could see introduced uh, the, this carbonyl group in, in our LDPE um, plastic. And this is a very short treatment with actually um, an uncharacterized but very low concentration of this enzyme. So we're really excited about this tiny little peak um, because it seems like we might have identified one of the enzymes involved in, in polyethylene degradation um, from the, the microbiomes of, of these mealworms. Um, so my conclusions here, the microbial diversity uh, is, is something that really can be leveraged to engineer for these difficult phenotypes. Um, and um, basically, biology always finds a way um, so we can uh, deal with incredibly challenging wastes like polyolefin plastic waste. Uh, and that a lot of the lessons learned from both the model organisms as well as developing tools for these less than model organisms, I think can, can really help accelerate our ability to engineer um, 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 new domesticated microbes. Um, thanking my whole group here, sponsors, and that last thing was to thank Genscript for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and you can see them at booth 59. Thanks. It depends on the diet. The question was, are, are, the, are the worms uh, health, is the health of the worm being? So, so the worms are actually, I, I think there's, the interesting thing is uh, not from our own studies, but from the literature, the worms are really good at not absorbing a lot of the things that are nasty that are in plastics and pass it through. So, um, uh, so the worms aren't being too affected by this, but what's left over might not be, might be worse than what we started with. Sure. Yeah. But health-wise, <laughs> So health-wise, if, if you give them just the diet of plastic, nothing else, they're, they're, all, they're all in a process of wasting away and dying, right? Um, they're going to do like what you and I do is if we starve ourselves, we start to eat ourselves. Right. Um, and, and they do that. So they lose less weight when they're fed plastics versus not. Um, when we give them the nutrient supplements, it's a more complete diet, and they're healthier. They go through pupation like normal, um, so they're they're more or less, uh, I won't say unaffected, but they don't they don't have uh, strongly affected health when you give them full diets, including plastic. Okay, sorry, yeah. One last one. Sure. Uh, how many worms are needed for like a gallon of like you know like a milk jug or something? So um, the the data what we showed was that like basically. Uh, 100 worms uh, was eating about a gram of plastic. We did the calculation. Um, we eat about one, so they're eating about 1% of their weight per day. Um, now that weight is dry weight. We eat about 1% of our weight wet per day. So I think they're eating a lot more um, per unit mass than we do. Yeah. I think we're out of time and there's another session starting now. So if anyone wants to chat with me after <laughs> additional questions, we can do that. Thanks. And I think we are a little bit over time, so we will just go directly to our third invited speaker, Dr. Paul Su Huang from Stanford University. And the title of his talk is all you, um, One Loop is All You Need for Antigen-Specific TCR and MHC Recognition. Thanks for the invitation, and then, uh, I'm very uh, excited to, to be here because uh, the, the topic I'm going to talk about today is actually something that's brand new. Uh, we haven't published this. We're working on the, the manuscript at the moment. But uh, hopefully, actually, this topic uh, is somewhat of, a, of interest to people because now uh, this is essentially using protein design and synthetic biology to come up with a, a very uh, unorthodox solution to a, a cent uh, not century old, like to, for a very old pro uh, problem. So uh, the, as the title suggests, uh, there is uh, interest in binding PMHC. So these are, uh, uh, sorry, this doesn't work. Oh, yeah. So um, this is essentially uh, one of the holy grails uh, for immunotherapy, right? Because if you actually want to develop targeting systems for tumors, you have to somehow find them in the first place. And this, this is uh, uh, drawn from a, a recent review that basically are the, the uh, uh, 
biomarkers are on the surface that are being tested in clinical trials at the moment. And you can see that there are actually not that many. And uh, specifically, this type of uh, targets would actually uh, hopefully be used to direct uh, your immunotherapeutics. It could be antibody, it could be uh, T cells uh, to actually uh, kill these tumors. So one of the, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the, the um, strategy that people have proposed uh, uh, historically has been to actually come up with a way to tap into the uh, antigen presentation system. So uh, as you can see on the slide, the lower left corner, this don't, doesn't work at all. So, so uh, the lower left corner, right? So traditionally, you're developing antibodies to hit these, uh, hit these surface markers. And those are usually membrane proteins or receptors. But uh, if you actually have a oncogene or aberrant protein that's produced in the cell that caused tumor, the uh, change in the, in the cellular machinery will actually produce these intracellular antigens. And as you uh, potentially know, that um, pretty much 100% of the pro protein that's produced by the cell will go through this proteasome and get chopped up into little pieces. And these little pieces of peptide could actually get loaded onto these MAC molecules and then uh, be presenting on the surface. So this is this machinery and this mechanism is exactly how your immune surveillance works. Like your immune system was able to tell self cells uh, from foreign cells uh, and, and then would, would be able to attack the foreign cells using this mechanism. So the idea here is that if you can actually tap into this machinery and actually read these antigens specifically, and if they actually have the, the specificity for any sort of disease that you want to treat, and potentially there could be a, a very general mechanism uh, for hitting tumor or actually uh, viral infections, as well as many other type of diseases. So next slide, please. Um, so, so these are actually taking a, a closer look at these molecules. So the one on the left is a MAC class one molecule, and the one on the right is a MAC two, uh, class two molecules. And uh, as you can actually see that there are, are this little peptide so are wedged in these grooves. And the, uh, the top view is actually to take out these peptides and see their conformation that's actually sitting in these pockets. So as I mentioned, so these, these little peptides are actually derived from your cellular proteins. And of course, uh, all proteins are processed this way, but not all peptide identities are loaded. So this process is actually very stochastic, but uh, that also generates a diversity, and, and that's a, a, an opportunity for your immune system to actually recognize them. But from this picture, especially the bottom row uh, molecules, you can actually probably appreciate how difficult it might be to actually uh, access the identity of these peptides, right? Because these MAC molecule, the, the sort of the blob that's actually presenting these peptides, they are actually constant. Like everybody has a different makeup and, and it's sort of constant for, for the different cells. But the peptide that gets loaded onto them is only has this tiny little window, especially for the MAC class one, uh, to actually uh, access, uh, uh, to, to identify their identity and potentially make a decision on whether to kill the, the antigen at all. So, in order to actually solve this problem, uh, we really think that uh, a new system is needed. So next slide, please. Uh, the uh, complexity of this, this peptide loading onto the MAC is illustrated here. So traditionally, uh, people use this molecule to, called TCR, and then that's actually gonna come out in the next slide. But I hope uh, this picture actually uh, paints a picture of uh, the complexity that we really have to deal with if, if we're developing a novel therapeutics. So there are uh, certain MAC repertoire, right? There's multiple of them that's uh, listed here with the M, M level of complexity. But these cellular peptides or foreign antigens that could be generated is this top uh, N level complexity. So these two could actually uh, randomly pair to each other. And when they pair, you actually create this N by M uh, level of complexity. So if you're actually gonna develop a binder, like the, the little blue uh, sort of boomerang looking thing, uh, if you actually have any contact or any specificity, specificity to the MAC2 itself, you're gonna to have to deal with it N by N M, uh, uh, level of complexity. But the goal here is that if you can actually come up with an alternative solution where you really just read the peptide identity from that little window that I showed you in the previous slide, then potentially you can actually reduce the combinatorial complexity down to just the, the peptide level. Okay, so this concept is actually really important and, and uh, because if you have, you have to chase after this N by M uh, uh, level of uh, combinatorial complexity, 
there's literally uh, lots, like, you know, uh, numerous experiments that you have to do, and then there's a lot of cross-reactivity that you have to deal with. So next slide, please. So um, the, the idea of using this type of strategy, and then this is just sort of like an overview of how this type of system can be used. And of course, currently there are many companies developing this type of technology, and mostly relying on uh, recycling natural uh, TCR, T cell receptors, or using developing antibody to actually replace the TCR to, to uh, take on this role. But this, just to illustrate that you could potentially use this type of targeting system to deliver drugs. It could be used to deliver uh, uh, any type of immune therapy uh, strategies, for example, FC fusion, or even just put it onto T cells, then now uh, it could use it as a CAR-T therapeutics. Next slide, please. So, Coming back to this picture of like this molecular design challenge, right? So as I mentioned, so on the very left is actually the protein structure of this complex of a TCR, which is naturally uh, 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 how uh, your, system, your biological system reads these peptides. But in the middle is essentially showing you how this footprint of the TCR uh, engages this, this uh, uh, interface. So uh, highlighted in the middle are these uh, six CDR loops and they're very complicated, and as you kind of see that uh, there are two you know, uh, loops sitting in the middle that are labeled CDR beta 3 and then alpha 3. Those are actually the two primary uh, anchors that, that sort of uh, recognize the peptide specificity. But the rest of the loops are actually just sort of like a Mars lander that, that kind of, or lunar lander, that, that sort of anchor itself onto the MAC molecule itself. Okay, so this molecular design is really, really elegant, and of course, it's keeping us alive uh, uh, you know, through millions of years. The, um, the idea here for this engineering that is very challenging, and potentially TCR is not the best molecule, is because now, out of these six loops, half of it is already responsible for landing to the site, and only you're using a very small subset of the protein to uh, be responsible for the antigen recognition. The, uh, cross-reactivity, say if you swap out the peptide with a, one that's different in identity, uh, there's no way to avoid this cross-reactivity. Okay, so uh, due to this footprint uh, issues, and also naturally your uh, T cell receptor cannot bind too tight, because if they uh, bind too tight and cross-react with other uh, uh, cells, or sorry, other antigens are uh, from the, your cell protein, then you will potentially get uh, autoimmune disease. So, so this uh, window of opportunity for di the targeting these, these disease-causing cells is actually very, very small. So uh, I hope that, you know, this is just to give you a background as to why this molecular engineering challenge is so hard. And uh, next slide, please. So we actually just went back to the drawing board to try to see if we can actually come up with a, a, a novel system that can solve this problem. And we list, literally just list the specifications that, that we have to hit. And, and essentially, we want to get something that's very stable and perhaps it's just like a, a, some small protein that you can easily uh, produce and, and have high yield. But the key here is to allow you to accommodate to new antigens so you can actually cater your, your binder to a specific target. So it has to be something that's moldable and then potentially actually uh, looking like an antibody, but, but it doesn't have the, uh, the problem of cross-reacting with, with the background. And next, uh, click, click. So uh, with this uh, design, essentially what we uh, come up with is that the requirement is to, to have something that sits on top of this groove, but you do have to have an antigen uh, recognition element that, that actually could sit on the peptide. Next slide, please. So we found inspiration from a natural protein that looks like this. Uh, I'm not, I don't have time to go into details, but uh, this natural protein actually has a lot of features which are highlighted in this yellow text that uh, requires improvement. And we actually apply our um, uh, cutting edge protein design technology to actually improve it. And actually once we improve on this, next slide please, uh, we, our idea is that we can cut down the, all this noise but then we essentially uh, come up with a stable scaffold, but has this one green part of the protein that actually would act as if it's actually a CDR3 on an antibody. So if you can actually take this molecule and only tweak the green sequences, and it can accommodate to the different uh, anti antigen identity, then perhaps we can actually just solve this problem with this single uh, loop. And then that's why the question mark is like, okay, is one loop uh, sufficient and can, is that all you need? So next slide, please. So, we actually just took this molecule, we make that single little loop, and we make five mutations, literally just five mutations, uh, and those are saturating mutations. And then this is uh, using the, the uh, precision mutant library uh, uh, 
gotten from, from uh, GenScript. And, and we actually just simply use this master library and select it against the different uh, uh, TCR, so sorry, different MAC. So actually, there's a little bit more detail here. So the three targets that we use, they have exact same scaffolding. Okay, so the protein part is all the same. But the antigen peptide that's loaded onto it are all different. And uh, click, please. And actually, it turns out that even just with this one uh, master library, we can already derive very specific binders. And, and this uh, three by three plot, just to show you that these uh, specific binders, they don't actually cross react with any of the, the other targets. So uh, uh, moving forward, essentially, we uh, also uh, take these binders, select it against different MAC, different uh, um, antigens, and actually we now actually have a whole set of these uh, uh, binders we call tracers that are actually highly antigenic specific, and they don't cross-react, and then they're actually very stable, and it's very easy to produce. So next slide. So uh, maybe if I have time, I, I will actually uh, go slightly deeper into this question of specificity. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, the goal here is to actually just read the peptide but not try to cross-react with the MAC scaffold. And, and this is actually just showing these binding curves, the, the vertical uh, column on the left-hand side, is actually uh, taking a binder that is specific uh, to one of the peptides, but take that same peptide target but load it onto a different MAC and see if it binds. Okay, and it turns out that it still binds. Uh, and then click, please. And what's also very fascinating here is that not even for the peptide identity that, that we get specificity, um, for one of the uh, antigen that we have derived derive a binding for is called a clip. This same antigen actually can load onto an MAC in two different frames. So when, it, uh, and then it turns out that uh, our binder is actually very specific to a single frame that we, we uh, selected against. So, so on the bottom right is essentially showing that on the left here, we develop a DR1 clip2 frame uh, binder. It does not cross-react with, a, with, a, with a, uh, a different loading frame, but it cross-react with a different MAC, but has the, the proper frame. So, so again, we come back to this notion that we actually build a very uh, antigen-focused uh, binding uh, uh, molecule. Next. Next slide, please. So, so uh, and, and as, as, a, as for the cross-reactivity and, and the level of specificity, you can say that, okay, maybe you only have one single loop. How specific can this be, right? Because there are so many different combinatorial uh, sequences that can potentially be loading onto this peptides. Can we actually differentiate something that just have a point mutation, right? If you have, uh, so oftentimes there will be tumor antigen, and this particular one, the particular example is this very famous IDH1 that is found in glioma and other tumors, uh, it literally just has this uh, R132H mutation on the surface. Uh, without the pointer, it's hard to say where it is. Oh, I, I guess I, I marked it. So, so essentially, this uh, particular internet just has one point mutant, and that's uh, actually would cause uh, uh, cancer. And, and we want to know if we actually, uh, our binder can actually differentiate that from the wild type sequence. And, and uh, in this particular case, our original binder actually is cross-reactive to both. But it turns out to, uh, it's actually because our footprint is just slightly off of that one mutation to the, to the right-hand side. So we act, well, our solution was to actually just create another precision mutant library and then slide the window over uh, by a few residues. And actually, uh, now uh, with a counter selection, uh, click please, now we actually can differentiate uh, down to the single point mutant level specificity uh, for this antigen. So next slide, please. Um, and, and lastly, uh, essentially, these are, uh, what I have shown you before are all just in vitro testing. So those are all uh, MAC molecules that we can, we can build, we can load the peptide onto. But uh, whether it actually works for cellular targets. Um, and these are actually uh, plots showing that these uh, peptides, when it's produced from the cellular machinery, we can still bind them uh, with very sp high specificity. And the different levels of, uh, of the, uh, the panel on the left-hand side, the second one, is essentially just a, a loading different uh, titrating con concentrations. So uh, next slide, please. And we, we finally uh, starting to try to solve the crystal structure or, or cryo-EM structures of this. We don't yet have the cryo-EM structure, but the, the, the uh, current uh, 2D average image actually directly matched the design that we have created. So, so our binder is this blue thing on the bottom, and it actually, uh, you know, if you see the outline, they actually, all the components match. So, sorry, two more slides. So, um, 
And, and that was actually a test on the MHC2 uh, class two molecule. And you can ask like, okay, there's this other uh, set of antigens that are MHC1s, and they have this, this curve loading uh, uh, onto the MHC target, how specific are they? So the uh, bottom two panels, you can actually see that when we actually make mutations of uh, every position to all 20 amino acids, it's what, what we're showing here, the top panel is corresponding to tracer. You can see that it only has uh, really three uh, blue spots that light up. That's actually the native uh, sequence of the antigen. And it does not cross react with any other mutation. And the bottom one that you can see that the top row almost has all these different colors is actually a TCR. The naturally occurring TCR is supposed to be specific, but then uh, the, the top row actually cross react with all the mutations that, at that position. And, and actually, we, we do know, uh, we do have a structure of this, but I'm not gonna show it here. But uh, we actually know the reason for this is because TCR is, uh, again, I, I was mentioning that it's only using two loops to recognize uh, this antigen. It's not sufficient. Like, it cannot reach the, the ends of the antigen. But the way we bind it, it actually, we form a cup. It just sits right on top, and it actually can actually cover the entire length of the antigen, and that's how we achieve this uh, very unprecedented uh, specificity. So, next slide, please. Yeah, so in summary, basically, uh, um, you know, it's a short talk, but so I don't actually reiterate it. But it turns out that you know the last line it really is the, the exciting finding that uh, you know traditionally and and actually uh, currently moving forward, people are developing, uh, putting a lot of resources on developing TCRs. But it turns out that you could actually just solve the same uh, same problem with just a one single loop, and you can actually uh, if you can actually create a high quality library to bind them, uh, this is how we uh, actually can solve this problem. And then the last slide is just uh, uh, my acknowledgments. Uh, so, and thank you for your attention. Yeah. Is there infinity of the four kilogram bundle? So, so this is a very good question. There has to be, right? Like, I mean, it, it, it defines the specificity, but it turns out it's very, very weak. It's only when the loop combined with a, with a four helix bundle, it forms this molecular surface that's unique to your target, then it actually can bind. Because if you actually delete the loop, it doesn't bind at all. Yeah. Is there any effect of, let's say, the cell viability of the antigen? Um, you know, we go ahead and do loops and loops, or yeah. we take out loops, there's gotta be some sort of Oh no, our, our platform is actually fully synthetic. Like it's not a cellular, uh, we're exactly. building like a new biologic drug. Like, so, so it's actually a synthetic protein. So you guys have a good roadmap about like, you know, the Oh, so, so, so when we build this, this is actually a drug itself. Okay. So, so we don't actually have to remove the loops from a biological system. But we do have evidence showing that for this MAC1, uh, the very last uh, set of uh, data I show you, we actually can actually kill uh, tumor cells specifically. Yeah. Oh, sorry, that's too many hands. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, maybe. Oh, hello. How large of a library is there? Oh, that's a very good question. So, so as I mentioned, that we actually use the, the precision mutant library, and that actually allows us to dial in, like, you know, what are the composition for the, each of the positions. So. Uh, in the panel that I show you, it derived from five positions mutant, uh, randomly mutated. But then we don't want stop codon, we don't want uh, um, cysteine on the surface. So it's actually just 19 to the power of five. So I don't know what that number is. Uh, it's very, very small, very, very small. But then, but then once you have this footprint uh, narrowed down, we could actually extend uh, to different regions. Like, like I show you with IDH1, we could actually make the library slightly uh, stretch to a further region uh, to, to cover specificity. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Yeah. Currently, we don't. So, so our strategy currently is to actually just to kill the cells. We, we haven't actually tried to under, understand whether it actually changed the cellular mechanism. But, but uh, this type of tool, even though we're using it for killing tumors, 
but it has a, a, a significant implication in many other diseases. Because actually, we have collaboration on tracking uh, Parkinson's disease antigen, tracking celiac disease antigen. It could actually be a diagnostics platform as well. Uh, but we don't necessarily use it to try to manipulate the cells from the outside. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that's why we did this uh, uh, site saturated immunogenesis. Essentially, we come up with only two sequences that will cross react. And the, the two sequences being uh, at, at the first position is either serine or threonine, which is kind of analogous. And it's actually very specific to every other position. So, so it's, uh, um, we, we haven't actually broadly test a, a on target, off target, but I think that's actually a pretty convincing result that our, our binder is very specific. It's East display, yes. Yeah. Talk about sliding. Yeah. Sliding the five. Yeah. So we could do either, either or. So, so what happened there was that we took the five, we created a binder against IDH1, and then we realized that it cross react with both wild type and the mutant, and then we just add more residues and then create a new library on top of that, on top of our, our binding sequence. And then, uh, then, then we can actually create this uh, single uh, point mutant binder. Yes, actually, we, we realize that when you actually stretch the loop, and you can actually add more residue to that region, uh, it also it does increase the, the, the affinity. Yes. Yeah. All right. OK, maybe. That's a very good question, yeah. We, we are thinking about doing that, but from our structural work, I think it, of course, you, you could potentially derive the identity of the loop to the, and the target, and then uh, use machine learning code to actually predict what a, a sequence might, might be. But it turns out, uh, I think we could still do that. But what, I, what we realized once we uh, studied the structure is that there are many different binding modes, because the binder could potentially pivot and, and the loop confirmation actually, yeah, you could actually just throw it all in the black box that we can potentially use machine learning to, to decode it. But I think that the mileage may vary. It might not be as specific, but, but we actually are thinking about doing that, so, okay. So one more, one, one more question from myself. Um, what type of therapeutic modality can be designed based on the tracer system? Yeah, so, so I had that slide uh, showing we can implement it as a, uh, a drug conjugate. It actually, maybe actually the simpler answer is that anywhere antibody can be uh, uh, used, you can actually just replace the antibody with this platform. And uh, the advantage of this over antibody is just that it specifically reads these MAC antigens. So you, you could actually have a much better specificity in hitting tumors uh, than, and, and you can hit these internal uh, sort of like intracellular targets uh, as opposed to just surface uh, antigens. So, uh, and, and then what we are testing right now, we're t implementing mainly as a, a bispecific. So, so we just yeah, create this synthetic uh, molecule and then it's a bispecific that can activate T cells. Uh, we're also testing in CAR-T format as well. Okay, yeah. all right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Huang. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. All right. So last but not least, let's welcome Dr. Deepak Ragothaman from Allozyme, and he will be sharing with us how to develop cell-free and cell-based solutions uh, with enzyme engineering. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Just to manage expectations, I have a PhD, but I'm not a professor. So, you know, just to be on that side of things. So I'm with Allozymes. Uh, we are a Singapore-based startup. And it's a story of a technology that was built in the National University of Singapore, and now we have taken it to market. So at Allozymes, what we do best is we do enzyme engineering, and we're trying to improve cell-based and cell-free approaches for industrial solutions. Oh, there we go. OK, it's working. Oops. Right. So our mission at Allozymes is to design and develop custom enzymes for different industrial biosolutions. And we can do this because of our proprietary technology. Sorry, could you go to the next slide, please? I don't think this is working. Yeah, so at Allozymes, as I was mentioning, we have this proprietary ultra-high throughput screening platform, which is based on microfluidics. It's a patented platform that was built by our CTO. 
And we are the first company that's able to test millions of enzymatic reactions in a single day. So compared to the state-of-the-art robotic microtiter plate systems, we are 1,000x faster. We are 10x cost-effective overall for an enzyme engineering campaign. And we are 200 times more reliable from a library coverage perspective. Next slide, please. So here's an animation to give you a sense for what's in the box. OK. Next slide, please. So as you saw in the animation, we could build a million droplets in a day and screen a very large library. And here's an illustration of that workflow and how it would look from a scientific perspective. So we have these microfluidic chips, and we have proprietary designs for these microfluidic chips that have been adapted for enzyme screening and engineering. And imagine the well plate of a microtiter plate being mobile. That's each of these droplets. It's a closed system that is one experiment in itself and we can inject a single variant of interest and package the reaction environment. And we screen through thousands of droplets a second. And this is due to the proprietary hardware and software that we've built. And of course, to then assay the reactions, we have a toolbox of assays that allows us to cover a wide range of enzymes for a number of different applications. And we also have a sorting mechanism that, based on gain of function, is able to sort the droplets that have an improved activity. Now, compared to a microtiter plate, well, you can do all of the same assays that you would run, intracellular, extracellular, or lysel assays. But on top of that, you're now able to screen label-free. Now, in the commercial world, you would not want to tag your substrate or product to assay activity. And that's what we try to emulate. We get closer to commercial process by using label-free systems for screening activity. Further, we can do a broad scan of different pH or temperatures or other environmental factors that might be relevant for the commercial process. And of course, because we do very low volume reactions and picoliter scales, we have very high resolution and precision of measurement. This allows us to pick candidates that are very low in activity and improve that activity through different iterative screenings. Next slide, please. So going back to the sort of large screens that we can do, which can go up to 10 million in a single day, what we're really able to accomplish at Allozymes is to cover really the whole protein sequence space. I think there was a question to the prior speaker about what's the size of the library. Imagine if you could do a single site mutagenesis on the entire protein sequence and do a combinatorial screen of all of those sequences. That's what we can do at Allozymes. Now, this really allows you to identify new hotspots of activity and new combinations that allow us to build better existing enzymes or new enzymes for industrial applications. And we can take it one step further to go into discovery of new enzymes for novel applications. So as an example of a commercial use case, we had a large industrial customer that's running a very large fermentation process for a feed. And they had this challenging enzyme candidate where they were trying to improve KGAT over KM for a number of years. Using our platform, we've been able to improve 10x activity in under two months because of the large screens that we can do at Allozymes. Next slide, please. So as I was mentioning, we can do full site saturation for the whole protein sequence. So if you can imagine five hotspots and three cycles of these five hotspots, that's 3.2 million combinations. So we can do that in under a single day and do more campaigns on top of that on a daily basis. Compared to a standard microtiter plate, that's just a minuscule of what they can do with this technology. 
Now, what it allows you to do is also do new IP and improve your knowledge landscape. So from a sequence to function perspective, you're able to uncover rare combinations that give you new functionality. From a commercial point of view, this also helps you to build new intellectual property and freedom to operate from a commercial process. And interestingly, although this is directed evolution, this platform lends itself to also non-GMO technologies such as random mutagenesis, where the benefit of the large screen allows you to gain efficient screens using random mutagenesis. This is important for sectors like food, for example, where there's a sensitivity for GM challenges. Next slide, please. So at Allozymes, we're not just building large data sets. We're also leveraging the advances in data sciences and AI. So the whole platform sits on a cloud infrastructure, which is machine readable. And with the large number of data sets we generate on a daily basis, we're now starting to run machine learning programs with AI, which allow us to become more intelligent and smarter for each of the campaigns that we are running. So this translates into value to customers or partners that we work with, with better enzyme manufacturing or enzyme engineering approaches. Next slide, please. So the toolbox that we're building is a versatile platform that allows us to cover a broad category of enzyme classes that can be applied for a number of different industrial applications. So we are able to tackle challenges on functionality, stability, activity, selectivity, et cetera. And we are building a strain toolbox that has both model and non-model organisms like yeast, E. coli, Pichia, Subtilis, et cetera. And as I mentioned, with the AI add-on to that, it makes our platform truly versatile and getting more and more intelligent by the day to solve industrial problems. Next slide, please. So as an example of what you can accomplish with this platform, it really accelerates your upstream discovery and gains overall project timelines for commercial deployment. So there are two ways in which we can bring value to the customer. One is improved biocatalysis through custom enzymes for bioprocess, and this can apply to cosmetics or food or pharma applications. On the other end, we're adapting the platform for strain engineering for production of high value actives for food and cosmetics. And here it's about building a biosynthetic pathway that is more efficient with a better metabolic flux that generates more of the product, which is a high value ingredient. I'd like to walk through some case studies here that we have done with uh, commercial programs. Now this technology was first built for pharma, for API manufacturing. So the first use case was a pharma use case where the customer had a challenge with a substrate of product conversion. The enzyme was an anchor selective and they wanted it to be non enantioselective selective to improve yield of the process, which is exactly what we accomplished in under three months and improved overall yield by 70%. The second use case is on enzyme activity, where we improved 10x activity in under two months for a feed example. And the third example is of multi-enzyme cascades. This is an internal product where we're looking at a natural pathway that produces a high value active. This is from a tomato plant, the precursor to lycopene. So we looked at the natural pathway, we took out two steps, we put two new enzymes in the pathway and improved overall titer by 36% in under less than a year. Next slide, please. So why am I here today is also to talk to you about GenScript's partnership. So we started working with JetScript early in the day for Position Mutant Library, which I'm sure some of you are quite familiar with. And it eventually led to a partnership where we realized we have complementary capabilities to serve our customers. So there are different use cases where this partnership could be helpful. One way is where a customer has a discovery problem and they use our platform to build knowledge. We get the library from GenScript, we do the screening, and the customer gets the protein or antibody of interest. Now from a customer and a value point of view, this partnership allows us to cover definitely a larger library for the customer. From a time and cost perspective, it's much more accelerated and better cost profile compared to standard micro data plates. Next slide, please. So I believe some of you are familiar with the GenScript platform. It really allows you to have a faster turnaround time and a better cost profile, and has a higher precision with less bias for your mutant library generation. Coupling that with our platform's ability to do faster and more reliable enzyme engineering, we're also able to unlock new sequence to function information that is useful for commercial applications. Next slide, please. So from the business point of view, we practice two different business models. One is a fee-for-service, where any one of you might have an enzyme engineering problem. You come to us with a use case. GenScript builds the library. Allozymes helps you with the screens. And off you go, you have a better enzyme that works for your use case. And we also have a platform approach where we do more than one enzyme. And that's something we can talk about if some of you are interested. 
And the other way we work is also applying the platform for screen engineering for high value products. And here we are improving pathways, building new IP. So there's a licensing business model. We also are building internal products in the company, looking at cosmetics. We have two high value compounds that we are scaling up. And we also license those for certain applications. Next slide, please. Now, there's a typo on the name, but uh, we've spoken a lot about technology, but we're all aware today that climate change is real and we need to have climate smart and sustainable solutions. So while Allozymes has amazing technology, we're also helping building a sustainable world. Now, it'll be surprising for you that the, the approach that we take is already sustainable by generating zero waste, and we use way more, way less plastic and chemicals compared to a standard microdata plate. But we're using this platform now to build sustainable processes and products, which overall can also reduce carbon footprint and use less water for commercial production. And this is the team. Uh, we have a highly interdisciplinary uh, team of PhDs that come from different skill sets, microfluidics, protein engineering, data sciences, biotech, and we're based in Singapore. Today we're a team of 25, and we're growing fast. So that's Allozymes, and I'd be happy to have a chat if any of you have any questions. Thanks very much. Sure. Right. Right. So, well, it's real. So we do 10 million a day. There's different ways you can slice and dice that 10 million. You could have 10 proteins with a million each, or you can have two proteins with five million. So you know, okay. depends on your need. And you're working with Jessica on the library on that. That's right. That's right. Just to let you know, we do have an eight million chip. So if you have any eight million different variants per batch, we got you. That's great. Some use cases. Could you elaborate on one cases in detail? Um, how the clients, say in biopharma segment, benefit from your platform, and how the partnership with Genscript contributed to this process? Sure. So I think the pharma use case is an interesting one, where we had to build a half a million variant library, and this is where Genscript came in with a library offer, and we built the screens for the customer, which translated to a better enzyme that helps them to have an improved process with a higher yield where the enzyme was helping to have less enantial selectivity, which converts more substrate to product. So this was one of the use cases that was one of the very early use cases we had. Okay, thank you. Please. Right, so for us it's customer driven, so it's based on the commercial use case. Now, there are certain enzymatic processes that people want to do cell free, where there are other processes that are better done with the mobilized platforms, which is cell-based. So it really depends on the commercial use case, and we build the platform and the variants based on the commercial use case. Great. Any further questions from the audience? All right, thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I think that wraps up our speakers' talks. And um, according to the agenda, I will give a five-minute closing. So once again, thanks to all the speakers that graced us today with their fantastic work. It's just simply amazing to learn how synthetic biology um, can help develop the nanoscale new therapeutic modality or enhance antigen-specific TCR and MHC interaction, um, or to create a microbial circular ecology, uh, or to enhance industrial enzyme evolution. There's, it's just so many things that um, Synthetic biology can do. Um, and as a service provider, we are proud to be able to serve and accelerate some of these processes. Um, and no matter it is gene synthesis or gene fragment synthesis, oligo and oligoposynthesis and uh, library construction, um, we are here to serve you. So let us know how we can help, um, and you will be in good hands. So once again, we want to thank our audience for participation and engagement. Um, and if you want to learn more about our technology, technology and our services, feel free to stop by uh, in our booth. Our booth number is 59. Um, and also, uh, one more thing is that we will be sponsoring the Biopharma Mixer Happy Hour social event tonight, um, starting at 7 p.m. And I think the location is at uh, District of Oakland, which is like one block away from here. So um, you are cordially invited to join us for the happy hour, and we can talk more about how we can collaborate and find more synergies.
So lastly, we want to thank the event organizer for providing us this stage and this opportunity to further strengthen our uh, connection with Zimbabwe community. So um, thank you everyone, and we look forward to seeing you in our booths and in the Bao Mixer, Bao Farmer Mixer Happy Hour.